Yes. Um, she, uh, oh, I have the, the 12 p.m. meeting. Uh, 12 p.m. meeting. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, 12 p.m. meeting. So, uh, yeah, huh? It's like 12 to 2, and then I have a meeting at 3. Oh, yeah. 12 to 2. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have. Uh, is microphone clear from the audience? Just in case, if it's not clear, we have a personal microphone. Okay. I think you're using your microphone too, right? I think that we can ask the audience if they hear me. Yeah. Can, can you hear us clear? Can someone confirm that hearing yeah. us? Probably I shouldn't move that much to around here. Do I, have to turn, do I have to also turn on my camera or no? Uh, you should. I should? Yeah, you should. I think you're fine. You agree? Did people confirm that? Okay, uh, welcome everyone, and okay, also welcome the audience from the from the online. Uh, we are very happy and delighted to uh, have the quantum matter seminar at the CMSA. And welcome Sona Najafi from IBM Quantum, and she will be speaking about measuring the central charge in IBM quantum processors. Let me remind the audience, please feel free to uh, ask questions in chat with Sona and uh, also uh, people on the Zoom, please feel free to ask questions. And let's welcome Sona, okay. thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining. Let me also first thank Joven for giving me this opportunity to presenting some of my recent work regarding vision and central charge in IBM quantum processors. Of course, no, no work, uh, can I just actually? Yeah, I um, There's a mole, I guess. Uh, yes, more. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Right. Yeah, of course, no work can be done alone. And I would like first thank my collaborators, in particular to a very talented student who actually joined a, this project as an intern last week, who is just here, and also as one of and my other collaborators in IBM. So as the number of qubits is scaling up, currently we have like about 433 qubits in IBM quantum chip. One of the questions as a researcher that we have, what kind of problems we can target actually with this quantum processes. Um, so over the past few decades, there are many different uh, areas that have been developed as an application, being like quantum simulation, or quantum chemistry or portfolio optimization and quantum machine learning. In particular, because the current hardware that we can be have, they are small, shallow, and they're noisy. Until we reach the fault tolerant regime, this becomes even more, more important than what kind of problem we can actually target. So historically, quantum simulation itself is one of the actually early promises for the quantum computers. And in particular, because of the different degrees of freedom that we have in quantum matter, that makes a lot of the theoretical work hard or challenging. And also computational schemes that we currently have, they can either work in some particular regime. So for example, quantum Monte Carlo might suffer from this time problem in low temperature. And the promises that quantum computers have for quantum simulation would be hoping to overcome these challenges and deepen our understanding from the different properties and in uh, 
quantum physics or material science. So currently there are different platforms I'm racing for reaching you know, the fault tolerance and like making all this quantum simulation available. Um, and then one of the focus of this talk today is gonna be exploring the fundamental science in the, in the quantum simulator. So as we know, um, if we actually look at nature from like, you know, we can actually see a lot of universal properties from actually galaxy scales to really some atomic particles because of the symmetries and the associated um, uh, mathematical uh, um, symmetry that we have in this kind of system. In particular, in the phase transition, this system actually show some continuous, uh, in the continuous phase transition, this system actually show scale invariance. And in particular for 2D, it is known that we have a conformal symmetry. So this was actually the, uh, the, very seminal work of the Bellarmin and Polyakov and Zamolochikov, who actually showed that in 2D, there exists this infinite dimensional algebra of local conformal transformation, and um, which most of the time can be also exactly classified. And at the heart of this conformal field theory is the Virasur algebra, which is one of the most important components of it is the central charge which can be actually used and help for classifying the universality in this, uh, in, for the two systems. Of course, people have been studying central charge in many, many different you know, systems and uh, also for different uh, physical quantities, it actually manifests across different quantities. For example, we can actually look at the two point correlations of the energy momentum tensors, which is related with the central charge or maybe free energy that people actually look at and also more recently, um, and I say recently over the past 20 years or so, also people have started looking at the entanglement for P and there are like the entanglement for P at the critical point also scales of the subsystem side where the coefficient related with the central charge. So maybe a little bit, let me focus in particular on the entanglement for P because that is a quantity that in quantum many body physics is, it's widely used. So how we can calculate the entanglement entropy, we can actually look at the subsystem side. We take the subsystem on the total system, and then we calculate the radius density matrix, and from there we can actually obtain the entanglement entropy and the generalization of it, which is the one uh, the, the way entanglement entropy, which depends on the different moments of the alpha. It is known, and it's, for example, proven that, for example, for the uh, for the one day systems and the gap systems, the entanglement entropy behaves area low, and also at the critical point, as I mentioned before, it has a logarithmic behavior where the coefficient of the logarithm is actually related to the central charge. But Despite the fact that the entanglement entropy is a very nice theoretical uh, quantity that has been used, for example, for classifying classify different uh, phase of matter and gives us a lot of information, but the central charge, which is associated for the subsystem size in the entanglement entropy has not been experimentally measured because the entanglement entropy is a non-local quantity and you have to actually do quantum state tomography. Of course, there are some schemes, for example, to calculate the second Rainy entropy, but generally speaking, it is a really hard quantity to measure. So the question that we've been asking me and my colleagues over the past few years is that, but what about other bases? Can we actually find other bases such that if we actually calculate some quantity like entropy, we can actually also extract information about the central charge? Again, to contrast it with entanglement entropy, which a lot of people are familiar with, um, here we can actually look what is known as a local Shannon or Rainy entropy, which again, we prepare this system in the down state, and then we take a subsystem of it, and we calculate the radius density matrix, but this time we will project it into some local basis, and we calculate the probabilities associated with each configuration that we have. And from them, we can actually calculate these local Rainy entropies. So uh, over the past few years, also people widely actually studied this quantity also for periodic or open-bounded condition across different quantum spin chain, 
for the total system and subsystem, and this is still a very active field. So in this talk and in this experiment that we have done, we're going to focus on, on two quantum spin chain, which I assume a lot of people are familiar, namely the easing the transfer easing model, uh, which is creatable at j equal one and j equal one, and they actually manifest C2 symmetry, and it's known that it has a central charge on half. And the next one, we're going to also look at the XXC model, which is creatable at this delta value of minus one to one, and it manifests U1 symmetry and has the associated central charge of one. And also, um, here I'm going to actually talk about two different methods to calculate the entanglement entropy. The first one, so we take our quantum spin chain and for different boundary condition, whether it's going to be open or, or the periodic boundary condition, we're going to calculate the probabilities of each different configuration. And from there, we calculate the gradient entropy in those local bases and we look at the scale. It is known that, for example, at the critical point, the scaling has a linear term, which is non universal, but it has a subleading term, which is the word make with the subsystem size. And it is conjectured that the coefficient of this logarithmic term would be have some information related to the same function. And here I'm just like showing the similar calculation for the periodic boundary condition. Wait. Yes. So the central charge here will be the total central charge, which contains both the C left moving and C right moving. It's either CL plus CR, is that right? I think it's just like one pure central charge we have associated just to the Verasur algebra of that like underlying uh, theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes people will also call the another central charge is different with the chiral central charge. And I suppose your system is not chiral. No, 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 no. Exactly. Simple C for the transfer. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thanks for clarification for this. Maybe I didn't mention. Yeah. So the second method that we I'm going to show that we can also extract the central charge. It happens so for some quantum system that we call it is stochastic. So what I mean about it, there is some physical system. Uh, this is actually from the paper of the Sergei Bribery and collaborators. They introduced this concept of the stochastic quantum local Hamiltonians. When we actually, for example, have the transfusing model, um, what happens in this kind of system is that the octagonal matrix elements are real and non positive. And one can actually also calculate the Gibbs density matrix, which are non negative value. And that implies that the ground state of these systems are real. And non negative. So that, that means that if I actually have the probabilities for the system, I can also calculate and reconstruct the quantum states. And this is only, this is true for the transfer easing model on the X and the Z basis, but is not generally true for the XXC model. Um, so once we calculate the quant or we construct the quantum state from those probabilities, now we can actually calculate the entanglement entropy as just a simple formula that we have. And now it is also known that this entanglement entropy at the critical point for the open and boundary condition, for in particular for the bipartite lattice of the left and right, is behave in this formula. And then we're going to look at also the both open and periodic boundary condition. So that was kind of a background about like what kind of quantities and measures we're going to look at. But now let me dive into some of the experimental details that we actually performed. So this is the overall pictures of the, 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 the setup of the experiment that we have. So the very first step is just like, we actually have our quantum spin chain of desires. And for now, we're gonna focus on only 1D quantum spin chain. And we, the next steps that we have to actually prepare this quantum spin chain at a critical point. So the way we're going to do it uh, in the quantum circuit is going to using variational quantum, uh, some variational quantum algorithms. And once we get the parameters of using those algorithms, we're going to set the parameters of circuit, both for the open and the periodic boundary condition. And once we prepare the down the state, we're going to do measurements and then calculate all the different probabilities for different configurations that we have. And we have some the steps regarding the error mitigation, and then there is some post-processing and the scaling 
for extracting the central child value. Maybe I'll stop here if there are questions from audience. If not, I can just like continue. Right. Uh, any questions from the audience? I think so far seems good. Okay. So as I mentioned, so I'm going to be going to look into my experiments that we performed over the past years. We actually um, did our experiment in two in in in, in multiple <laughs> different devices, but the result I'm actually going to show is on with the hardware e Taka and also Pixel. And we're going to look at the, as I mentioned, transfer easy model and XXC model, both for open boundary condition of 10 qubit and a periodic boundary condition of 12 qubit. So schematically, this is the different um, steps that we actually know. We actually need to perform our experiment. Let me just start with preparing the boundary state. As I mentioned, uh, currently, our hardware is noisy and is small and shallow. And there are some methods um, known as evaluation of quantum algorithm that allows you to actually prepare the ground state of some particular quantum station. So for, let me just uh, go a little bit, uh, explain a little bit for those who are not familiar with these models. Um, we, at the heart of the variation of quantum algorithms, we have a parameterized quantum circuit which actually takes our initial states, and this is our ansatz, and then we have some cost function regarding whatever the uh, targets that we want to achieve with our variation of algorithm, and then we pass our parameters to a classical optimizer, and then after the optimization done in the classical computer, we update our parameters. So this variation of algorithms have been very popular for actually Preparing the down state of quantum chemistry, or also there is some uh, one variation of it known as a quantum variation approximation optimization algorithm that is also suitable for, uh, op for optimization problem and it can be actually used for different variety. But for now, we will focus on two variational algorithms, one being the variation of quantum eigen solver, where the answer that we currently have it just like this. Simple check and four answers. So first we actually put all our qubits in the equal superposition. And then we have some parameterized quantum circuit. And then our cost function is just the expectation values of our Hamiltonian, right? To find the ground state. A slightly different variation of a variational algorithms are the quantum approximation optimization algorithm. These are more um uh, physics inspired, also kind of akin to the adiabatic uh, computing. And the idea is again, you have some parameterized quantum circuit, but the parameterization that we can have in this model is more closely related with the Hamiltonian that we are trying to um, find the ground state. So here I'm going to show the results of the down the state first with the transfer easy model, just comparing the QAOA algorithm with the victory, and just like we're trying to actually find which one does better that we can actually implement in our hardware. So on the top part here, I'm actually showing the uh, the fidelity for the energy itself, and then compare it with the QA and the victory, and the lower part this is the ground the state fidelity. So <laughs> As we can see, while overall QAI actually reaches earlier to a better approximation, and as we actually increase the number of steps, the optimization that we currently have becomes harder. So, but if we actually compare it in the case with the XXC model, um, again, overall QAI, it does, uh, yes, it does slightly better in reaching in reaching the, 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 the better energy and the better fidelity for the ground state. But overall, we see that the QA has some problems in the optimization. So for the rest of the talk and what we actually implemented in the hardware, we're going to, I'm going to stick with the VQE result and the VQE state preparation, both for the XXC model and also transfer to this model. But of course, once we actually start to implementing the um, Ansatz and the, the ground state preparation in the in the quantum hardware, the real hardware have a lot of noise. So there is resource update, 
noise can be energy relaxation or dephasing, or there are some crosstalks for hearing noise, measurement errors, leakage, even cosmic rays, and a lot of other resources. And the question is that, is it possible to learn the noise with accuracy, efficiency, and scalability? And that is the part that is very crucial to actually perform and get any meaningful result out of our experiment, which is the learning the noise in the hardware. So let me, I'm gonna just uh, provide a very general view of the, how the error mitigation is done, but a lot of the detail can be done can be found in this paper, or you can actually look for this uh, barcode here, where is a talk given by Zlatko uh, on, 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 the, on the probabilistic error mitigation. So generally speaking, say that we have a quantum circuit, which we have some single qubits and then some entangling gates, which are in L of them that we have. But of course, our, our hardwares are noisy, then we can associate with this entangling or the unitary evolution some noisy channel, which in general is going to be four to the n multiplied by four to the n kind of a matrix, right? And the idea of the error mitigation to is actually learn this gamma, but this gamma b gamma matrices, and then imply the inverse of it. But of course, this is a very very delicate matter, as these are not like might not be the positive and semi-definite matrices, and things can be challenging, and that's the work has been uh, proposed in the following paper. And we actually use those error mitigation, and once we actually implement the error mitigation and adapt our circuit with the probabilistic error cancellation, then finally we do the measurement in the local basis. So like we had a bound state, I already talked about we use the VQ to put the down the state. And now we also learn the different noise characterization of our uh, hardware for that particular ensemble that we have. Then finally, we do the measurement in different bases. And once we have those probabilities, we can actually calculate the, the, the range entropy. And after we calculate those, we can actually look at the scaling and then obtain the measurement that we have. So we can, after we calculate this edge of alpha, depending on the boundary condition, we can actually look at the subleading term and try to figure out what is the coefficient of the central. So is there any question? Maybe this is a good point again to, st to stop, if not. Okay. So here I'm gonna actually, because there's just so many different cases, I'm actually gonna first give the summary of the results that we have, and then I will dive into like different cases that we have. So as I mentioned, we did the experiment both for the easing and also the exit C model. Um, and then we did it for the open and the periodic boundary condition. So for the open of the system chain of L equal 10, because this was a stochastic and Metrolian, we can actually also reconstruct the quantum state with a good fidelity. But since this is a very small system size, even the result from the exact diagonalization, if you actually fit the fit the and find the central charge, is going to give you 30% of error. And that is almost true for the calculation of the Rayleigh entropy for the exact diagonalization and also experimental result that we get. But luckily, because we have a specific design in our hardware that we can actually also easily implement the periodic boundary condition, the result for the L equal 12, we now, because of the boundary condition, periodic boundary condition, we actually take less. Uh, it has a smaller finite size effect. And we can actually obtain a shallow range entropy with less than 5% for this method. In the case of the XXC model, for the open boundary condition, the final size of effect is even worse. So we, I'm not going to report any, any, any result for this one because even the exact diagonalization result for this pin chain of 10 is pretty bad because also there is some oscillation in the XXC model. Literally, we don't have enough data point with the system size of 10 to really get any meaningful thing. But in the case of, again, periodic boundary condition, um, we achieve again like something about like a five percent error of uh, calculating the central charge. By the way, yes, 
this possible using the same device, you can also choose possible larger open or close boundary. Yes. By, by for example, closing the pool. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, we could. People like that, that the help or is there more, even worse? Well, in practice, we could and all that. Like the... 12 and 10, but you can possibly go like uh, both uh, 13 and maybe. You mean like, yeah, 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 you can actually go like we have. We have hundreds, so you can actually, in, in principle, you can, but the problem, there are a few, few different issues. I was going to mention in the end some of the challenges, but since that's a very good question. So the, there are a few different parts. First, a lot of the variation algorithms that we use most probably will not scale to really big system sizes. As the number of qubits becomes bigger and bigger, the variational algorithms becomes harder to train and like reach your ground state, right? One is the problem of ground state preparation. So it's like, can we actually efficiently prepare the ground? This is really, really hard technical problem. And the second is just the noise. Like, of course, as you increase your number of qubits, the number of gates increases, the noise also increasing. And the question would be, would the error mitigation schemes that we are using would be able to capture, but also the error mitigation schemes that we are using is probabilistic, and it actually requires a lot of sampling. So the, the, the bigger the number of qubits you have, you have to do more and more and more sampling. So it becomes very expensive. So that this is like, yeah, thanks a lot for bringing it up, because this is a very elaborate experiment to actually at even system size and 10 and 12 get any meaningful result both because of the ground state preparation, because we are actually keeping the ground state at the critical point, and secondly, because of the error and noise that we have in the, in the, in the hardware. So can I uh, understand correctly, is the XSC chain result is, is, is no definite? That's this is, the data. This is uh, uh, for the open, we have a data. We, we, we can prefer, but for the spin chain of 10, there is also oscillation. So you look at the subsystem and there's like data point that you have two, four, six, and eight. And out of those four, there's also oscillation. So you only have to get the even one in the case of XXC model. So literally means that you have two data points. And even in the case of exact diagonalization, just forget about experiment, just do a simple exact diagonalization on the XXC model of a spin chain of 10. This, you can't really get anything out of two point. Like you don't really get, but but for the periodic boundary condition, we don't have that oscillation problem and we have 12 point and we can do the fitting. I, I'm gonna show the results, the fitting result. I'm uh, sorry. The, yes. The low, bar, the low right box is L equal to 12. Yeah, sorry, 12, sorry. Yeah, good, good catch, yeah. It's periodic. <laughs> you know, you just pop the page from right here. So that's what, okay. Um, first, I'm going to show the results for the transfer easy model, open memory condition. As we, as I mentioned, if I actually have the probabilities measured from the experiment, because this is a stochastic Hamiltonian, meaning that the ground state real and non-negative, I can actually also reconstruct the quantum state. So here I'm just showing the data. So the blue line is just the exact value, just we get from the exact organization. The red is the raw experimental data before doing the error mitigation. And as you can see, we actually do the personal one doing and learning uh, the noise characterization of the hardware. It actually improves our estimation of the probabilities. And once we calculate the ground state from the mitigated values, we compare it with the exact diagonalization, which for the system size of four, we are almost able to actually prepare the ground state with 99% fidelity. But of course, as the system size becomes bigger, this reality is actually the case. Although for this very experimental data, I, I believe this was a really good value that we achieved. Now, once we actually have the probabilities, these are the measurement on the Z basis. So we take those probabilities, then we calculate the associated range and of those probabilities, and then for the system size of 10, I'm actually looking at the substance level, two, four, and six, and so on, and we actually perform the 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 the, 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 the value that we get from the central charge over here, um, 
are actually shown like the treating values over here as well. Uh, what we actually obtain for the exact diagonalization, even at the system size of 10, this value is about 30, 0 0.32. And therefore the value that we actually have from the mitigation value 0 0.64. Um, this actually telling us even if the exact value, even if you do exact diagonalization, we won't get any meaningful result for the central charge because of the finite size effect and the boundary effect that we have for the open boundary condition. And that is why, um, let me also talk about the entire entropy and then I'll go back to the periodic boundary condition um, because we would be able to actually construct the quantum state. We can actually calculate the generalized way entanglement entropy for different values of the alpha associated with the left and the right hand side of the data. So this is actually the exact diagonalization result. And I'm only going to show the result of the dating for the exact diagonalization of the open mounted condition and calculating the second radio entropy and compare it with what we get from the mitigation. So the entanglement for the open mounted condition is quite bad. And I can tell you why, because for the system size of 10, we have two to the 10 different probabilities, and some of them are really, really small. And when you actually calculate the, uh, the, the entanglement entropy, you first reconstruct a quantum state. But the way that you reconstruct a quantum state, you actually need all two to the n different probabilities, which means that your error mitigation and everything should be really with a good accuracy in all of the probabilities that you get. And then when you actually build the density matrix, you actually have, you should have everything with a good accuracy. So what I'm suggesting here is that the entanglement entropy, because it's non-local and requires all the different probabilities that you have, is not, even though we can actually calculate it from the experiment, is not a good quantity. But what if, if we actually compare it with the local radiant entropy that we actually explicitly measure from the uh, different probabilities, um, what we actually observe here, so for example, again, I calculate the radiant entropy, but this time I'm only, as you see, like there is a value of alpha, and this has a weight, so it means that the probabilities that are bigger have more importance in this like uh, radiant entropy. And I'm less sensitive, most probably, for the probabilities that are like very like, small, and maybe their mitigation is not done like, properly. And we calculate what is known as um, high alpha, so we can actually get rid of this, which is the mutual information just to get up this linear uh, term over here. And here I'm showing the results of the exact diagonalization, the bold grain and the lighter grain, which is the mitigated error. And for both cases, we can actually see that we obtain a better result from the experimental data. I should just make sure. sure. So all these data is the baseline uh, exact is a numerical result. Yes. And uh, the the square box exact means which kind of exact the data the, the discrete data the box the, the box. The, the, this one? Yeah, like yes, that one is that is that the it's the exact diagonalization. Just take the uh, transphasing model. It's also numerical. This is numerical. This is experiment right. mitigated. The circle one. So the dash line. The dash line is the fit. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we extracting, we extracting. So here I'm fitting to this uh, to this quantity. So you can think about this is a Rayleigh entropy, but you can actually calculate the mutual mutual Rayleigh entropy just to get rid of this beta r over here, and then you you fit i of two which is the second mutual information to this quantity. And the coefficient of that fitting gives you this C alpha P, which is related to the central charge. And alpha has a critical value. So people actually, no one calculated that alpha for the transfer using model is one. So um, for alpha bigger than one, there is a strong con like evidence, many, many different numerical results that indicate that this value is there is no mathematical proof for the Iranian entropy. There is a strong numerical evidence that this central charge should be that sorry, this coefficient should be the central charge. In comparison, this transfers 
IC model the previous the boundary man. condition L equal to 10, your central charge for the exact and the meter can differ by almost points. Um, yeah, but both of them, they had about 30% error. So even if the, for the open boundary condition, forget about experiment. If you even even do open boundary condition, exact diagonalization is not gonna, the, the value of central charge you get is like about three point, sorry, point zero three two, which is about like 30% something error from the, the value of the central charge because of the boundary effect. If, if you really want to get the central charge for the open boundary condition close to half, you really need to go up to like 20, 30 qubits, which is not feasible at least at this point for the experiment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be hard. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you have, as I mentioned, because of the ground state preparation and the noise and all that, it might be tricky to get there. But I mean, I think that what is interesting, we were fortunate that we explicitly had this 12 periodic boundary condition in our hardware. And already 12 for the periodic boundary condition gives a good, good estimate for the central charge. But like the, 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 the question is that like the experiment, we do some error mitigation and uh, like uh, truncate some of those probabilities that are not good, uh, but that is not effective in the rainy entropy. But in the entanglement entropy, you cannot truncate it. And that is effect. And the whole point I'm trying to make, instead of actually calculating entanglement entropy, these local entropies are better measured. And you can still get some information from the central chart in these quantities. Maybe a little bit in the final part of the talk, I will talk about some of the data that we have. So this is actually data, I think, for the open boundary condition, but I'm not showing anything on the, on the peeping side. But just showing that like we actually perform the measurements, so we have all the probabilities and all that. And the results that we actually uh, perform against it is for the periodic boundary condition. But this for the XFC model, uh, one actually has to calculate the critical uh, alpha from the following uh, formula that we have for D. It is known to be, for example, two. And the value of the delta that we did the experiment is minus uh, one half. And from there, we actually extract the value of alpha C to be three. And for the case that we calculate IQ, so which means that the value of the, the, the C alpha P that we get, it is one divided by four, which is 0 0.25. And we just like, again, repeat the P thing that we have over here. And in this case, also the value of the exact diagonalization and experiment more or less they coincide. So I think with that, I don't really have much left to actually talk. It's just like um, showing that we can actually explore some of the fundamental laws of physics in the current quantum simulator. And we were able to see and detect the footprint of the central charge by looking and only and measuring in the local rainy entropies. And the, 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 the few technical uh, experimental like help that we had, it was just utilizing this probabilistic error mitigation, which is very essential to actually get those beta strings with the better accuracy in order to be able to get the estimation of the central charge. Let me go back this I already talked, but this was your question, but I already put in the outlook and challenges for this kind of experiment. Of course, we would like to actually scale this kind of experiment for a bigger system size. But as I mentioned, the quantum state preparation, not only for us, I think for any other quantum platforms is a very challenging process. Uh, of course, some other platforms, AMO physics platform, they can actually use adiabatic protocol and all that. But in general, the variational algorithms they suffer from training and parent plateau, and we also need to maybe look for some no novel variation algorithms to overcome these challenges. And as I'm talking right now, a lot of my colleagues at IBM daily they try to improve the hardware qualities in terms of entangling aid and all that, and also uh, improving the error mitigation schemes that would help us to actually get a better. Um, 
experimental data out of different simulation that we do. I think with that, maybe I stop here and take questions here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the yeah. wonderful talk. A question from the audience. Just remind me the analytic result of the uh, transverse icing, the CFT, as the central charge is one half, is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, but, but, and then you do both periodic and the open monitor. Yes. And then, but you get some result not, not close to one half. No, open is not, but periodic we get half. Then we get half. 0 0.48. Yeah. Can yeah. I see that again? Yes, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other one, yeah. Thanks. And for the XFZ, I think the, the one energy was one. And then we get 95, 0 0.95. 0 0.95. Yes, yeah, yeah. Great. Interesting. Uh, any questions from, from online? There are many people wondering. Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. So, do you think there are other next models one can think about? Yeah, we are yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you able interaction more? Fun? Yes, yes. One thing, one good thing about at least the 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 with the universal quantum computer, like a digital quantum circuit, is that like you can mostly cook up many different Hamiltonians especially if they are not like crazy long range or all to all connected, but you can actually think about any other local Hamiltonians and the process to do the experiment is exactly the same. We don't really need to do repeat anything else. Of course, you have to do variational algorithm for different Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. but I think that's one of the benefits of actually using a digital computers compared to other animal physics that are very, for them, it would be difficult to actually elaborate from one mm -hmm. physical system to another because they have to have naturally have that kind of engineer, that kind of interaction in their system. But for us, it's just like you write your Hamiltonian and you do the variational algorithms, which in the end, is just a trotterization of your terms in the, in the unthoughts. And we are already doing for some non, for, for long range interacting system as well. I didn't show the result because we haven't done their mitigation yet, but we're doing it to in one not a quantum system as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we can talk more about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I have a simple question. So, like if I understand correctly, what's limiting like the uh how precise one can predict this entanglement is like from experimental noise not like the tomography part um are there like any like mm -hmm. is it possible to like prepare the ground state by like realizing a Hamiltonian directly um like like can you like engineer like the interaction directly and like prepare the ground state instead and then tune the parameter I mean, you mean more in the adiabatic form? Yeah. I mean, there are methods you can actually do here as well. And I think there are some other papers that attempt to do adiabatic comp like state preparation using like IBM or some other quantum, you know, circuit. <laughs> but again, I don't know in practice, again, they will suffer from noise and all that. And I think, I think like, I remember now that we prepared, we used, we tried to actually do some adiabatic state preparation, even though the energy was kind of good, the fidelity of the ground state itself wasn't good, right? Yeah, the critical point was really hard. So sometimes also people only pre like uh, report the energy, but I think it's really important that like in the plots that I showed, we actually report the 
fidelity of the state itself. Of course, here, because we can actually do exact diagonalization, so we have a privilege to actually compare the quantum fidelity. But at least, you know, like we really made sure at least the ansatz and the ground state preparation we had to begin with was about like 0.99% and even up to four, five, nine to do the ground state preparation. But generally speaking, ground state preparation stays one of the most challenging mm -hmm. part, in particular, if you're at the critical point, you know, because of many, I mean, of course, these are very, still a small size, uh, but, um, in general, ground state preparation is uh, still, I think, is a very interesting uh, question that if people can come up with more efficient way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking if even if you don't prepare the ground state exactly, like if the fidelity is not as good as if you cross like the phase transition, like even if it's a slightly different state, like the central charge extraction should still be okay, right? If it's in the same. You mean mm -hmm. like some quench dynamic or something like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, a good, that's a good question, most probably. But yeah, then the thing is, is that like like performing, you're saying that like, but are you doing it still the ground state preparation and then you're doing a quench? Yeah, I'm thinking of like, yeah, like exactly the red bird kind of sweeping thing. Um, maybe that's completely not right. Yeah. Uh, so you start with some ground state that's easier to prepare, and then you. I mean, like adiabatic. Yeah. yeah. As, as I said, yeah. like we kind of did a similar thing in mm -hmm. the simulation, even in the in the absence of the noise, it wasn't like the ground state that we get wasn't good. Like VQ, we gave a better result. But the central charge is also not good. You're saying you. I mean, if we, if we didn't even have the ground state to prepare to start with, we didn't even evaluate the essential charge because I, I didn't have even the right ground state prepared. But we tried something like an adiabatic protocol, the state preparation, doing a simulation, not on the experiment. We, we, were, we were exploring different methods of ground state preparation. And after trying many, many different things, at least for the system size of 10 and 12, the vari like VQ and variation algorithms work the best. Gotcha. But of course, then the issue is like, is how we can scale this up. But you know, for now, it's just like the question is that, can we extract a central chart even with this small system size that we can do the experiment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah, so I have a question. It seems yes. the system is built up by qubits only, but can, can we try to make a qubits so you may be able to do like a zippo, also just the, you know, maybe four dimensional qubit space per degree of freedom mm -hmm. of a qubits type of a chain instead of the, the qubits. But then what would you get from that? Like some other central? Like different CFT, yeah. I don't know you they... could, but you can actually also look at different CFT in other quantum spin chains too, right? Sure. Right. Yeah. Well, building Q that is sure. difficult. <laughs> I wish they would, but we have some interesting work coming out actually generalizing um, Jordan Wigner mapping for QDITs. Um, that if we have the hardware, how we can actually do the simulation. We've already maybe use few qubits to constrain qubit space in some way to get the QDITs. I don't know about that one. I mean, I'm, I'm, no, yeah. but um, I think on the theoretical aspect, um, yeah, QDITs are interesting in general, uh, I think, uh -huh. but maybe for now a little bit far from practical. I mean, there are teams and groups that are working, so there's a fun city group working on uh -huh. like QDIT, but even yeah. now they're on the tree level of transmits. But yeah. There was an uh, audience I know, you, you, are, you are, uh, has a question? Even so, no, you, you may know the answer. On the QDIT? Yeah, you may know. Yeah, yeah. I'll ask him. Oh, okay. Uh, any more questions? Well, if not, so we should uh, thank. Oh, yeah. Well, now again, thank you very yeah. much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Very Thanks, everyone.